Welcome to the Woo Woo Way podcast. My name is Zev Rice. Today's podcast is an edited version of my first formal conversation with George Falcon. Before I introduce the talk itself, I should say a few words on who I am, who George Falcon was, and how I came to do this podcast. Who I am isn't really important to this podcast, but just so you know a little bit about who it is that's doing the talking, I will say a couple things. I am an entrepreneur and venture capital investor by profession. Over the course of my career, I've founded or backed dozens of young companies in the technology, clean energy, media, and financial services sectors. I've been married for almost 20 years and have two teenage sons. Though my parents are both Catholic, I wasn't baptized, and other than a couple of times at Easter or Christmas and maybe a few weddings, I hadn't spent, spent much time in churches growing up. Nevertheless, I have always been fascinated with spirituality, the nature of our minds, and the cosmos. While I have always had certain spiritual convictions, I had continually been disappointed with the various traditions I studied over the years and de developed quite a strong cynicism about most religions, self-help gurus, and mystical traditions generally. And so, given my busy work and family life and lack of a tradition to enmesh myself in, I didn't have much of a spiritual life to speak of. What I did have a plenty were the physical and emotional woes that I think are all too common, even among those of us who are apparently making a success of their lives. And as a result, I had recently taken up meditating and begun reading widely in contemporary and historical spiritual texts. Meditation and Buddhism were things that I had had some exposure to in my teens, but I had dropped pursuing them due to my conclusion that no self didn't seem like a very attractive goal to attain, even if you didn't have to spend a lifetime of dedicating oneself to a spiritual path at the expense of all the good things in life to get there. Enough about me. Um, more importantly, who was George Falcon? Before passing away in 2016, George was a Southern California-based spiritual teacher and mentor who spent his time lecturing, leading meditation retreats, and guiding students on their spiritual paths. Thanks to his rich background in both the ancient spiritual and contemporary scientific worlds, when George Falcon speaks about spirituality, he brings a language, a tone, and a structure that I think are more accessible and acceptable to the modern ear, certainly as to mine. I encountered George in the kind of way that could never have been predicted. My wife and I were at a birthday party for an old friend a long way from home, and we were happily chatting away late one night with a dear friend from our mutual hometown of Los Angeles about the random and idle sorts of things one talks about with dear friends late at night, when she mentioned in passing that she had a guru. I was immediately skeptical and resistant, and my wife was immediately intrigued and entertained. A conversation soon that only deepened my suspicion, but fortunately enhanced my wife's interest. Fast forward a few months, and my wife had been to a number of group lectures with this mysterious spiritual master named George Falcon, and had begun having private sessions with him. At that point, I was really suspicious about what was going on, and, con and had convinced myself that she had joined some sort of cult, <laughs> and uh, this was going to end up draining our bank account and breaking up our marriage, and and uh, and so on. So I decided I had to meet him for myself, and uh, just make make clear what a uh, uh, quack this guy was. Even if I uh, established that he was not some sort of a quack or cult leader, I certainly didn't expect to begin private sessions with him myself. Like most, most people advancing towards middle age faster than we ever expected, I, I of course had my share of physical and emotional challenges, but believed they were under control and I had no need of the wisdom of some random old man from Long Beach who seemed to be spending a lot of time with my wife. So I ended up having two introductory encounters with him that I'll, I'll share with, uh, with you. The first one entailed me driving down to Long Beach through rush hour traffic. And now listen, I live nowhere near Long Beach, and if you know LA traffic, you can see the, the level of my concern, and I'll admit curiosity was pretty high at this point. I found myself in a small apartment in a, a rambling building somewhere I had never been or heard of in the darkened and, on that particular night, foggy streets of Long Beach, California. The apartment was crowded with people, um, I, they gathered each week in this little apartment to hear, hear George talk. This particular night, he was speaking about the Diamond Sutra, and I have to admit, I was blown away. Here was this bearded, bespectacled man in a rumpled tracksuit giving ad lib one of the clearest, most incisive, and simple commentaries on a spiritual text I had ever heard in my life. My skepticism on his intellectual abilities melted as he spoke, and despite my com discomfort with the word guru, my suspicion about his guru-ness rapidly disappeared as I bathed in the glow of his warm and avuncular presence. 
I had this experience of just feeling better by being around him. It almost didn't matter what he was saying. I just felt my spirits rising the more time I spent with him, and I left that night's talk feeling light and happy. The only time I had felt that with another human being before in my life was when I had gone on a retreat with Buddhist master Thich Nhat Hanh in my teens and had had a similar opportunity to be face-to-face -face with an enlightened being. I was relieved and fascinated after that first encounter and asked my wife if I could join her at her next private session with George, this time not so secretly hoping, hoping that he might have some insights into the various persistent patterns of dysfunctional behavior and ill health that had repeatedly evidenced themselves in my life, and with a disconcerting increase in frequency, I must say, as I aged. Though holding this hope, uh, I uh, admit that I went into the session thinking he'd either try to convince me of some particular religion or <clears throat> work with me using one of the usual psychotherapy methods and then charge me a bunch of money to compensate him for his valuable guru time. Instead, as you'll hear in this episode of the podcast, <clears throat> which contains most of that first session, after he had asked me my star sign, yep, of all things my star sign, and my personal <clears throat> religious background, and my diet, he then jumped right in with the model of the chakras, told me about various types of cats, talked to me about martial arts, and then off I went on the rest of my day. Ah, I was a bit dazed. This was not what I was expecting. Was this the same person who just a few days before had spoken with such authority and clarity about one of the most difficult and complex texts in the Buddhist canon? Was this the same guy who, as best Nina could gather, had turned down an acceptance letter from Harvard to study, study psychology at a respected local university and had gone on to study quantum physics and comparative theology, theology at a doctoral level? And he's talking to me about what kind of cat I was, my chakras, karate, and what my diet consisted of? <laughs> Though I admit I, I did love the martial arts part. <clears throat> you would think that this would have confirmed all my fears. Instead, I was kind of fascinated by it all and though I was uncomfortable admitting it, I did have to say that his comments about my personality based on my star sign and type of cat were eerily accurate <laughs> and actually really helpful in thinking about how I responded to various important situations in life. So <clears throat> after I had gathered my wits and tentatively decided to see him again, I did the sensible thing and asked my wife what was the situation with compensating him. Again, I was surprised. She told me that she had asked him that same question a few sessions after she had begun seeing him privately. He had told her that she should just pay him only if she wanted. She did want to and asked him how much, and he answered that she should just pay him however much she was able or inspired to pay. I think this uncertainty went on for a while, but she finally asked what amount did other people of those that did pay him paid. I can't recall the number, but relative to the standards of an hour of someone's time that we were used to paying, it was tiny. So for lack of any other direction, we began paying him that amount for our private sessions. I will say that in all the six or seven years we worked with George, he never once asked for money or brought it up again, even when weeks or months would sometimes go by where we would forget to pay him. So that is how I started seeing George. I did adopt his dietary suggestions, and at least in my case, within days I started noticing quite significant improvements in my health. Neither I nor George are dietitians or nutritionists, so I'll spare everyone any more detail on this than what I've left in the talk. There are more than enough nutrition gurus out there already. I will also say that it seems like almost a day doesn't pass that I don't think of his four rules of martial arts, so I would encourage you to listen closely for that towards the end of the talk. Finally, a few words on how the podcast came about. George passed away last year, and though I still feel close to him in a spiritual sense, I do very much miss our weekly conversations and his various group talks. To fill that hour or so each week that we used to spend together, I decided to go back and start listening to some of the old conversations, all of which he allowed to be recorded. I tend to be a full contact reader, so I found myself using my spare time to take notes on these talks, started working on a website encapsulating many of, the, of, his, of his methods, and began collaborating with my wife on the book that she had begun writing with George a couple of years before his body died. For some reason, I recently felt inspired to take these notes and some of the elements of the book and website and put them together as this podcast. So that's the story of me, George, and this podcast, in case you were wondering. I've chosen to do this episode both because it allows me to share a bit of history, as I have. It provides a great introduction to the beginning student, but also because it serves as a good complement to the episode prior to this on the levels of consciousness. 
it goes into some introductory detail on these levels, but from a largely different angle. And he's speaking to someone, me, who at that point has never heard of these concepts before. In this talk, he refers to them primarily as chakras, and rather than doing just the first five, he goes through all eight to complete the picture. As with the last talk, he does a better job than I could explaining them, so I will leave that to him. And because this is an introductory session, I don't think it needs much explaining anyway. I will say that in general with these podcasts, sort of like with George's lectures and teachings, there's they're nonlinear, so you, you don't have to listen to any of these in order. Um, and uh, uh, it's a uh, process that um, just hearing it from different angles, you begin to uh, understand what he's what he's going at. It is worth repeating that he he starts out in this. Uh, particular lecture and, and often um, generally with students finding out two things about me before he speaks. One is my star sign, as I mentioned before, and the second is my religious background. I bring that up again because if you weren't a Libra like I am and didn't have a Catholic background and lifelong fascination with Buddhism like I do and did, he probably would have given a completely different talk. While I, as a good Libra, love hearing the big picture framework and respond well to stories about Jesus or Buddha, you may not. I've seen him enough over the years to know that he might just as well have stood you up and had you perform a basic qigong drill, laid you down and done a few basic hypnosis exercises on you, or spoken to you about the Kabbalah and Huna magic instead. So take that all uh, as context. Also, given that I was dealing with a, a few chronic physical challenges, he emphasized the importance of diet for me, since, as he says, the first chakra is often the biggest obstacle to spiritual progress. If you were a comparatively healthy person, he might not have said much of anything at all about diet. Okay, I'll hand it over to George now so he can take it from here. Well, let me start you out with a model, okay? Okay. Imagine, first of all, that you're familiar with the chakras, I'd imagine, right? Since you've, a little bit, yeah. Right? Since yeah. you've meditated. Yeah. So there are seven obvious chakras. And by the way, uh, different uh, traditions uh, divide them differently, okay? I mean, we can subdivide them and all that. But to me, to deal with eight chakras fills the bill, okay? So <laughs> some people have nine, 12, 15, and that's fine. You, we come to understand why they have them, but again, you know... For our purpose, we don't need such fine subdivisions, okay? Yeah. Because we're not going to be scholars on that. We're just going to use it as a map, okay? Yeah. All right. If you think of each chakra as a level of consciousness, mm -hmm. so we look at the first chakra, and traditionally, it would have been called the unconscious, mm -hmm. okay? So, but what I want you to understand is that these seven chakras or levels, sorry, I'm going to deal with eight, that these eight chakras are already there. They're functioning. They're responding to life. So I want you to think about them like you have a team, okay? eight players, like say football, okay? mm -hmm. or rugby, actually, it's closer, right? So you have all these players, and they're not on the same page. You're going to have chaos. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because each one of them is trying to do whatever they think they ought to be doing, and so it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, you want all of them to be doing the same thing, and you want the highest chakra to be the captain, running all of them, mm -hmm. okay? So one of the first things we start to pay attention to is, okay, what's the outstanding, because again, we don't need to subdivide them that much. We just have to have some idea of what they're doing. And then again, we, we're going to get them aligned, first of all, and then we're going to raise the frequency of all of them. Okay, so we're going to bring them to a higher octave, okay? So your first chakra, or the first chakra, represents the physical plane, and that tells us, for instance, the two most important components of the first chakra is responses that you give as a Libra, as a male. Mm -hmm. Okay? So when you see yourself thinking, behaving as a male Libra, you go, whoa, the first chakra right now is running the show. Mm -hmm. So it's just starting to pay attention because, again, if you don't know which consciousness is doing what, there's no way of correcting it. Pardon me, I'm, I really don't know anything about astrology. I don't even know what a Libra represents. We talked about this the other day, but I can't even remember. 
Okay. Balance. Yeah, balance. Libra is like balance. The other day, because you were talking about star sign, and I, (laughs) right, my mother says, "Oh, you're such a Libra." Right. Okay. I just ignored it. All right. So now what? We're going to use we're going to use this table as a model. Okay. Okay. For every level of consciousness, it has information, power or ability, and a sensibility. As you move up in consciousness, that becomes dominant. You have more information, greater ability, a better sensibility. As in, for instance, depression to fear, from fear to anger, from anger to, to boredom, from boredom to happy. See, the, the sensibility gets better. Okay? So, every level of consciousness has information, a sensibility, ability, power, and a sense of identity. A sense of identity. So, every time you see yourself define yourself as male, it's the first chakra giving you that information. Because ultimately, by the way, did you two ever read that book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus? I I didn't read it, but I know the... the It's an excellent book, because it's like, you and I talked about cats, remember? Ground cat, tree cats, etc. It's like saying, okay, males have a tendency to look at life like this, okay? Well, it's observing males, and they have a tendency to look at life like that, right? So that's what the first chakra is doing, giving people, males, a particular perspective that's different from a woman, okay? So, in fact, I'm going to start out with what I said to Nina the other day. This man is called the cat whisperer, okay? And he gets called in when somebody has a cat that's terrorizing the family, okay? This is really a problem, so... You're either going to help it or you're going to have to get rid of it. Okay? And he says, well, the first thing is you have to determine whether you have a ground cat, a tree cat, or a hunter. Because if you thwart the instinctive behavior of any one of them, you're going to have a problem with cat. Mm-hmm. Okay? All right. If Libra represents the wanting to have balance, when are we going to have a problem with the Libra? Mm-hmm. When there's no balance, right? Mm-hmm. When they can't find the balance. It's like the cat, right? This is a ground cat and you keep picking it up, right? And it doesn't want to be in the air. So start scratching because it wants you to put him back in the ground. Okay? All right. Well, since male is the other part of the unconscious, or what was called the unconscious, by the way, I call it simple consciousness because it's really not unconscious, okay? It's a comparative (laughs) term, right? Mm -hmm. But the simple consciousness is responsible for what's going on at the cellular chemical level. So many times, in fact, Monday was a good example. Okay? This young man, you know, practice, I mean, he's actually a practitioner of acupuncture, has done a lot of meditation, has had psychotherapy, but there was a problem that he couldn't understand why it was happening, okay? And what happens when we don't understand the simple consciousness or the subconscious is we go to the third chakra, which I'll get to in a moment, and we start trying to figure out what the problem is, okay? Since the first chakra is seldom, when you start, seldom aware of what's happening in the other ones, it comes up with a theory of why the problem's there, and it's seldom correct. So I'm listening to this young man telling me what the symptoms are. I said, okay, stand up, let me see. I said, now, the problems are your adrenal glands are weak. It's not a psychological problem. It's not even an emotional problem. It's a chemical problem. Okay? Mm-hmm. But if you don't know that's a chemical problem or it's coming from the first chakra, you're going to say, okay, the reason I'm feeling like this is because Nina forgot to pick up the laundry. The, the reason, I mean, you've got to look at your environment and say, the reason I'm feeling like this is because of this or my children or whatever, when in fact it's just a chemical imbalance. Deal with that, then the problem goes away. Mm-hmm. Okay? The second chakra is what we would call the subconscious. Now, the subconscious part of us is the part of us that records everything that's ever happened to you. Mm-hmm. It's the part of us that generates emotions. Mm-hmm. It's the part of us that makes pictures. So, let's say five years from now, somebody says to me, did you ever meet Nina's husband? I go, no. I, I, <laughs> sounds familiar, but no. Okay, and I look over there and I see turquoise. Okay, and I go, yes, I met him. And you say, well, why would that trigger that response? You're teaching. Mm-hmm. The problem with the subconscious mind is a perfect recorder, but it's terrible of cataloging. Mm-hmm. Okay, you would think it would catalog it 
relative to something, right? Uh, more important than the, the color of your T-shirt. So our problem then is to bring up historical events, discharge the energy of the experience. You cannot destroy it. And then say to your subconscious mind, this is what I want you to do with the experience, okay? I want you to put it over there. First of all, I have greater access if I know where you put it. And should it ever come up again, I know what to do with it, okay? Because a lot of times, a person, again, because they're trying to rely on the third chakra, is trying to explain why their emotions are there, okay? So one of the things that I try to teach people relative to the subconscious mind is never explain, rationalize, or justify your emotions. Unfortunately, psychotherapy is an attempt to help you understand them and explain them and rationalize them. Why? Because the huge majority of psychoanalysts or psychologists and psychiatrists have never mastered the subconscious mind. Had they mastered it, they would never tell you that. Okay? Then, if you're not going to justify, explain, rationalize your emotions, what the heck are you going to do? Well, you're going to have several options. One, suffer them. Two, explain it. I mean, talk to people about it. Three, learn how to get in touch with that part of you and direct what you want it to do. Okay? So, let's say, for instance, I'm working with a lady. She's, good. She's going to have to take a trip. She doesn't have to, but she wants to. She's going to get on a plane. She's always been afraid of flying. So, if you ask her why she was afraid, this is what she said. Well, the first time, I, I wasn't afraid of flying, but one time, I was seven, and my father and I were, were taking a trip, and he was panicked. And I kept looking at him, and he was panicked. I mean, he was so afraid, he was drinking. And I've always been afraid to fly from then on. Okay? Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Having that information, that explanation, has it helped her deal with the problem. No, she's still afraid of flying. Mm -hmm. How will I know we're successful when she comes back and says to me, never got upset flying. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. Now, what we're working on in the moment, at the moment is, aside from father, what do airplanes, being inside an airplane, represent to you? I don't have control. Number one, I'm contained. Nina, what's, what's a situation that people have all the time that might explain a situation in which we don't have control, we're in a tight compartment? <laughs> yeah, that's where we started with her right, too, right. okay? See, the, the birth wound. canal, mm -hmm. right? That's where the fear is coming from. And you say, well, wait a minute, what's that got to do with flying? That's the point, right? You now have to say to your subconscious mind, in picture language. That's one thing. This is another thing. They have nothing to do with each other. I don't want those emotions in this situation. Okay? That's the subconscious. Because that's what you're going to understand about that chakra. Then you later on will say, right, if I justify, explain, I will have some degree of satisfaction, but I still haven't solved the problem. Because that's not the cause of the problem. The cause of the problem is the subconscious mind has put two events together that they should have never gone together. Now we go to the third chakra. The third chakra controls the large muscles. Okay, so interesting. So where is the third chakra? Like here? Uh, in the solar plexus. Solar plexus, okay. Okay. Which, interestingly enough, uh, that's very much the hard martial arts, okay? The taekwondo, the karate, uh, that's third, okay? Interestingly enough, I, I can see why you would have chosen Aikido, fourth chakra, mm -hmm. okay? So, it, it was good news. When you started out saying, yeah, I, you know, taekwondo, etc., I go, whoa, that's too yang, it's too yang. You know, if you're going to be in the spiritual path, that's not going to help you. When you said, but I prefer... Aikido, I went, oh, that's good news, that's good news, because that moves you up to the next chakra, okay? All right, so the third chakra controls, controls the large muscles, speech, intellect, obviously, okay? It usually is the most dominant, particularly with people who are intelligent and educated. So they want to run the whole life through the third chakra, okay? 
because they've had some degree of success in life doing it through here, mm -hmm. okay? But to get stuck there stops your spiritual progress. Mm -hmm. So the next level, we call it transpersonal. Remember, it has information, each level. This consciousness, when it becomes dominant, gives you the realization, oh, I'm not the body, I'm not the self. Now notice, you didn't destroy them, they're still there. I'm just not them. Well then, traditionally, if you were in India, we'd say, well, you're an Atman. In the Orient, we'd say, you're a Buddha. Uh, Christ said, you were a God. Now, whether those terms are linguistically equivalent is not important. What's important is they all represent the fact that you're not the body. You're not a human. Okay? If you want a more general term, you could say, okay, I'm spirit. If you want a more general term. That's okay? the word in my head. When you're talking. Same. So, the, the aha is, I'm not the body, I'm not the self, I'm not a Libra, I'm not what I think, I'm not what I feel, I'm not what I do. That's the self, okay? So now, we start to look at the self like the cats. Is it a ground cat? Is it, okay? So you are an air cat, okay? Libra. Okay? You're an air cat, okay? What does that mean? Well, it means that you're going to have a tendency to look at things and try to analyze them, define them, rationalize them, explain them, okay? Because you're a Libra. Mm -hmm. Libra, okay? Mm -hmm. okay? Air, okay? So you're going to have that kind of a, an experience. And so you're going to find being grounded very difficult. Okay? Now we've got a tree cat and you won't let it climb. He's a he's a climber. Like he rock climbs. That's right. <laughs> That's it. See? So you're a tree cat, right? So if we don't let you climb, <laughs> it, it thwarts your instincts, right? <laughs> okay? So I say, okay, we've got to let him climb. Okay? Because otherwise we're going to have a problem. Okay? Yeah. So again, just understanding what each chakra is contributing to your life experience starts to give you the techniques of how to deal with that particular consciousness, okay? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the average, especially intelligent, educated person is always trying to deal with all aspects of life from here, mm -hmm. okay? the third chakra, the intellect, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, relative to what we would call the end result, where we eventually want to get to, this will stop you. Think of this as the best it can do is get you to the door. Mm -hmm. But it will not take you through the door. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, I like uh, the way Dante said it. He, he called this Virgil. Okay? He anthropomized it and called this Virgil, the intellect. Right? He says, Virgil can take you to the door of heaven, but can't take you through. Mm -hmm. What takes you through? The fourth chakra, which he again anthropomized and called it Beatrice. Well, what does Beatrice mean? To be happy. Okay? So, see, a positive emotion is required to get into heaven. So what's the first commandment? Love. What's the second commandment? Love. See? So, again, love is a necessary component and is responsible for us getting into heaven. But what's another outstanding aspect of the heart chakra? It is the part of us that is intuitive. It is by its own nature compassionate and empathic. So what has religion tried to do? Open this chakra in all the wrong ways. That's why it's a goal of all religions, and many of them have failed to produce compassionate, intuitive, and empathic Right. Move to the fifth chakra. The fifth chakra, remember, always information and an increased ability. The fifth chakra gives you the experience of the whole. In contemporary psychology, they call it cosmic consciousness. It's a view of the whole universe and how it works, what's its purpose, what's this whole thing about. Sixth chakra. That gives you the realization that everything is perfect, whole, complete, and there's only one. This is where the idea of there's only one God, not two, 
Only one. There's only one mind. But whatever term you want, but there's only one of whatever it is you're terming, okay? Mm -hmm. Whether it's power, mind, whatever, because it depends on which side you're going to be talking about. So there's only one love, or there's only one wisdom, or one truth, whatever it is, but there's only one. The key thing is there's only one, okay? It gets you away from all dualities. That's why it's important, and probably the primary goal of almost all meditative techniques. To try to get this to open up. Okay? Now, if you are successful, and again, when I say successful, each chakra sim simply requires a, some degree of mastery. Okay? You don't have to be perfectly good at it, because it is necessary, because your, your primary goal is that they don't interfere with what you're doing, and what is it you're trying to do? You're trying to get them to integrate so you can move them up to a higher octave. As you move them up to a higher octave, more things that you would have had to work to let go drop off automatically. That's why it isn't necessary that we have a perfectly healthy body and a perfectly healthy, pure subconscious, because you could spend the rest of this life doing any one of those, and you still wouldn't reach the sixth chakra or the seventh chakra or the eighth, okay? The seventh chakra. The seventh chakra gives you the realization not only that there's one, but that this one is limitless, infinite, pure, clear, unperturbable. Unperturbable. It interferes with nothing, and nothing interferes with it. It disturbs nothing, and nothing disturbs it. The eighth chakra. I prefer this term, there's many other terms, but the eighth chakra gives you the experience that is very difficult to explain because it's truly trans-conceptual, trans-verbal. There's no way of explaining it. Why? Because you come to a realization, really a remembrance, that your true essence and the structure, mechanism of language and thinking are not isomorphic. I don't know what isomorphic means. Isomorphic means that you have one system and another system, and every point in these match. It comes from math, okay? When you're doing analysis in math, you have a math system, you have an experiment, and you're trying to find a math system that matches like your a, design. A mapping. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if it's isomorphic, then... Each part of your design and each part of the premises of the math model you're using are isomorphic. You can trust the results. Okay? If they're not, then you have a lot of trouble determining how accurate your conclusion is. Okay? Language and your essence are not isomorphic. Okay? That's why you can't explain it, rationalize it, or anything like that. So now you have to sort of switch gears and say, all right. What's it like? The Chinese like to call it being fully awakened. In Zen, they call it attending the grand affair. In Buddhism, is going to the other shore. See, every major culture has an expression trying to indicate that it's different from everyday kinds of experiences. Okay? So there comes this point where this movement from the seven to the eighth, and it gives you the sense that you are totally, vividly, brilliantly, consciously present. No more, no less. There's nothing you can say about yourself, there's nothing that needs to be said, and that's the end of the spiritual process. Okay. Again, the key is what to do at each level enough that they start working together with the highest chakra running the lower ones. Okay? Now, for instance, since you come from a Christian tradition, at least initially, this chakra is called Lord. This is the Christ consciousness. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it's called Lord because it's supposed to be Lord over the other ones. But it's one with this, so they work together. Right? That's what Jesus meant when he said the Father and I are one. I'm in the world. See, I'm in the world, so I'm the one that is directing everything in the world. 
When that chakra becomes dominant, it starts to run all the other ones. And now they're working as a team, and you start to elevate them all. Okay? To me, that's a very useful excuse me, model, because I keep saying to people, particularly in the West, we got the lecture notes, but we didn't get the lab notes. So we got the theory and no experiment. And that's why there's so little progress. Okay? Mm. That's why when Jesus predicted that we would do greater things than he did, and it hasn't happened, because we never got the lab notes. So nobody knows what it is they're supposed to be doing. Not sorry. They know what they're supposed to be doing. They don't know how they're supposed to do it to get there. Okay? Yeah. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to make your body more alkaline. Mm -hmm. If your body is acidic, which comes from stress, by the way, mm -hmm. then it's going to keep you from progressing. Mm -hmm. See, so when I say you don't have to have the perfect healthy body, you just have to do enough so it doesn't interfere with your progress. Okay? It doesn't get in the way. Yeah, it, otherwise it does get in the way. Like I said about that young man, that's why I brought him up. Okay? Mm -hmm. You've got to shift your chemistry in this direction. So right now, one of the biggest impediments in your spiritual progress is the first chakra. Mm -hmm. Okay? You've done a lot of good stuff for yourself, okay? So that's good. I mean, all of those are very much of a plus. But to really help yourself, you've got to alkaline your body, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's a very simple process to do. Just lots of greens. Get rid of this stuff, okay? Two things. Again, from a practical point of view. By the way, I was trained as a scientist, okay? So what I'm talking... I always say something like this. you got to take it to the marketplace. <laughs> you got to be able to demonstrate it, okay? Because <laughs> otherwise, it's just a theory, okay? Mm -hmm. Go to the drugstore, get yourself some pH strips. They just tell you the pH level, okay? It'll have a little chart color, okay? And start uh, measuring your first urination in the morning. Mm -hmm. It'll tell you where your level is, acid to alkaline, okay? And that'll give you a clue, because now you can think back and say, well, what did I eat yesterday, right? And if it's alkaline, you say, boy, i got to do more of what I did yesterday. If it's mm -hmm. acidic, you go, whoa, what is it I'm introducing to my diet Okay, that is doing this? Again, stress is the other one, right? So you might say, oh, okay, today it's acidic because I had these three meetings and they were all a problem. Mm -hmm. So, okay, but I'm not going to have those meetings every day, so I, I don't really have to panic. Okay, mm -hmm. But if we go week after week and it's acidic, Boy, we've got to look at some major changes in your life because otherwise you're going to kill yourself, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really that simple. Mm -hmm. No single cell organism can live in an alkaline environment. It requires an acidic environment, okay? You want to cure cancer? Get alkaline. It's really very simple after a while. It's just chemistry, okay? Mm -hmm. We make it so complicated, mm -hmm. okay? All right. So the next thing I wanted to point out to you, why this is important, if you were to read a book in urology in the 70s and the 60s, the finding was that the frontal lobe or the uh, pineal gland was calcified. They didn't understand why, because it's not calcified in children. It wasn't by, it was just pure chance that they were doing some experiments in the Menninger Foundation, and they had a group of people that didn't have a calcified frontal lobe. So they went, wait a minute, why don't they have a calcified frontal lobe, since that seems to be the rule for adults. Well, these people not only meditated, but they had the kind of diet that I'm suggesting to you. So now the goal was, can we reverse it? Thank goodness it is reversible. Okay, Thank goodness it is reversible. So what are the key components? Alkaline your body and meditate. Imperative. Okay, It's the best health treatment you can give yourself it's the best way to alkaline your body. Okay? So that's for the first chakra. Right? The second chakra requires, again, just techniques. But if nothing else, just start out by saying, okay, I'm aware of anger, and my mind doesn't know why it's there. So for right now, I'm just going to do an exercise. Okay? But please don't assign it to a person, a situation, a circumstance, or a thing. Okay? I'm angry because that person did this. I'm angry because this doesn't work. Don't do that because you're going in the totally wrong direction. So I'm going to give you a very simple thing to start with. If it works for you, that is excellent. 
sometimes a person needs something a little more complicated. But I'm hoping as a Libra air sign, uh, you've got a huge jump in the problem, okay? So you're angry. I want you to do something like this. I allow myself to be angry. I allow myself to let go of the anger. I allow myself to be angry. I allow myself to let go of the anger, okay? Do that, and it's a good air sign. It should be gone by the time you get to 10 repetitions, okay? The brain cannot handle two commands that are opposite at the same time. So when you say, I allow myself to be angry, I allow myself to let go of the anger, it goes, wait a minute, just make up your mind. <laughs> are we going to be angry or we're not going to be angry? But while it's waiting for the command, okay? Very simple. Again, as an air sign, it might just work for you. Why, that why, why as an air sign would that work? I'm sorry, look. Why, why does that work for air signs? Because ideas are very real to him. Okay. Since ideas are very real to him, then it, those words have a lot of power. Power, right. Okay? Yeah. Now, if you're, air, sorry, if you're an earth sign, which is the opposite, right? Yeah. Ideas are kind of like clouds. They don't have any substance, okay? So <laughs> now you got to have them do something that's very kinesthetic. Once they do something that's very kinesthetic, then they get the same results. Right. Okay? But that's the fastest way. Mm -hmm. All right. So just start with those very simple things, okay? And you're, you'll see yourself starting to move again, mm -hmm. okay? Now, to open up the other chakras, then we have to do other things. But at least, like I said, we want to make sure that the bottom ones aren't interfering with our progress, mm -hmm. okay? Because, again, it's kind of like, you know, uh, the, the weakest link can destroy the whole thing, right? It, so if that's not in order, you know, a lot of your other work just isn't going to manifest in the physical plane. You see, that's the problem. People meditate and they feel great, okay? But they get out of the meditative state and the first sentence they hear or the first thing they he see, and bloop, they're totally out, okay? They're back again to some more primitive lower chakra response. You want to be able to take what you've acquired in the meditative state into the world, mm -hmm. right? You want to get to the point that you're dealing with things and, again, are totally imperturbable, mm -hmm. okay? Now, at first, particularly, by the way, if you're emotional, not that you are, but if, if a person's emotional, that sounds like, geez, why would I want to be like that, right? But it's the best word we have, but it's not like it sounds. It's actually a very full sensibility. Okay? It really is sort of a combination of love, bliss, and peace. That's what imperturbability actually is like. So we were talking about this last night. So do you want to... So, so Zeb was like, I don't want to... I'm not interested in letting go of the world <laughs> because I would love you and I want to be in love with you. And this, this was actually what set me off my path and when I was like 21 a... or 22 was I, I, and I'm still stuck on that, which is I uh, feel that realizing, you know, the, the end of the path or the, uh, what, that's not the right way to say it, but the process you're talking about where that leads to is, uh, I, I'm afraid that I won't. I'll have to let go of my 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 love the, my loves. You know, Never. Right? You'll have to let go of your attachments. Right. You'll have to let go of your resistance, but you don't have to go of, of love. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If anything, your love is going to grow. Right. Okay. It's going to become more universal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you want to see it another way, just just to understand it, right? We go from erotic love to romantic love to agape love to unconditional love to divine love. Mm -hmm. And that's a heck of a different experience each time you move up. Okay? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, again, the only thing we're ever going to let go of us is attachments mm -hmm. or resistance. Mm -hmm. The reason you do that or it happens is because you come to the realization, oh, the source and I are one. I don't need anything outside to have that experience. I generate the experience, am aware of it, and share it. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, no, it's not like you're going to look at your children and go, who in the heck are they, and why would I want them around? Uh, no, it's nothing like that. I'm afraid all. to not be attached to them, I guess. Okay. That's the... the right. 
the resistance I have. <laughs> exactly, okay? But watch. So start out like this. I call it first order data. Are you ever going to fail to be their father? Mm. Well, I guess we don't have to worry about being attached, right? right. I mean, you're never going to not be their father, right. okay? Right. Right. So you're already connected to them. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be attached to them, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. To the degree that you become attached to them, then you're going to try to model them. If you're simply recognizing that you're one with them, then you'll allow them to be themselves. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if I remember correctly, they're both earth sign, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, you two are going to have a lot of fun. I mean, okay, because you're an air sign and they're an earth sign. Uh, you guys are going to have a lot of fun, okay? And I don't mean good fun. It's going to be this kind of fun. Because okay? <laughs> they're going to they're gonna look at you and go, what the heck is he saying, okay? And you're going, what the heck are they doing? I already told them the principle. Why are they doing that, okay? That's a different perspective in life, okay? Yeah, they humor me when I explain the principle and the background and the theory. Are you done yet? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, okay? They want to see how it works, right. okay? They don't want an explanation. So, by the way, one of the areas then is you're going to say something, and they're going to look at you and go, hey, I don't see it. I don't see what he's saying. I don't see it in him. Since I don't see it in him, it must not work. Okay? So that's part of the conflict, okay? See? So again, once you can see that, oh no, we're never not going to be connected. We just don't have a codependent relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to get them to replicate me, and they don't have to replicate me. Mm -hmm. They are who they are, They've come here for their own reason. They have their own karma. They have their own divinity. And they will blossom according to their karma. And again, the, see, the unfortunate thing is that, and I can understand that particularly, you know, when you think about Christianity, they've always presented the body and relationships as the problem. Mm -hmm. But they're only a problem dependent on the consciousness that we're in. Okay? Right. That, that, that's the only problem. It has nothing to do with the relationship per se or, or the world. Okay? In Zen, I don't know if you're familiar with this term because I don't know what kind of meditation you do, but this last step that we were talking about is called the grand affair. Okay? Mm -hmm. So Rankai was a very developed, honored master in that tradition. And one day he's walking with his disciple, and the disciple says to him, Master, what was it like to attend the grand affair? What did you gain? He said, Nothing. He said, Then why do it? He says, Because you come to recognize you don't need nothing. You're it. Well, then what difference does it make? Well, how does it demonstrate itself? He says, I eat. I walk, I sleep, I work, I play. He says, Master, we all do that. <laughs> he said, yes, but I know when to eat, how much to eat, and what to eat. I know how long to sleep, when to wake up, and when to go to sleep. That's how it demonstrates itself. Mm -hmm. Okay? No compulsion, nothing is dictating other than a flow and a oneness with nature. So nature is advising you you need an apple. You need an apple. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you go eat the apple and you say, geez, I feel good. And by the way, is it possible that one day you can go back to cheese? Definitely. But not right now. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's kind of like you sprained your ankle and we need to get you off the off your foot. Okay? Mm -hmm. And once it gets healed, you can go back and play. Mm -hmm. Okay? Right now your system is compromised, so you, you can't keep doing the same things that keep it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay? So just start out with those things. Okay? And again, as you keep doing what you're already doing, eventually, again, everything gets lined up. And then at that point, you'll be ready for other suggestions that might help you keep going. Okay? But again, I always tell people, give yourself the opportunity to make a transition. 
uh, you're probably going to make transitions pretty quickly because you're already pretty uh, disciplined. Okay? So the more disciplined you are, the faster you make the, the changes because particularly, again, as an air sign, you're going, well, that makes sense. Yeah, of course I'm going to do that. You see that? Boy, all I need is the principle, and I'm off and running, okay? I don't need a lot of examples of it. I just need to understand the principle. Mm -hmm. So if you understand that you have to be alkaline, then you go, okay, well, then I know what to do, right? I'm just going to keep track of that, and I'll figure out what throws me into the acid level and what keeps me alkaline, and that's what I do. Mm -hmm. All right, I now understand that the subconscious mind and the conscious mind only have somewhat of a friendly relationship, but they're not the same. And by the way... <laughs> That book is very good, okay? Men are from women, I'm sorry. Men are from Mars, women are from okay, Venus, because the second chakra is the woman in you. Mm -hmm. And the third chakra is the Martian in you, mm -hmm. okay? And when you understand the principles, you say, oh, I see why they don't get along, mm -hmm. okay? Because the man doesn't understand the feminine. And the feminine just gets fed up with the man and goes, what the heck? He's not listening. To he goes, I had enough of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what? So what if that happens? Well, the unfortunate thing is that the second chakra, until you move up to the, at least the fifth, the second chakra is the power source for the third and the body. And that's where, that's where illness begins to happen. Once the second chakra is no longer landing its energy to the third and the first in the body, we start to spiral down in health. Mm -hmm. Okay? Once the second chakra gets aligned, then the body starts to feel healthier, lighter, more, uh, more uh, limber, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, uh, in a way, I've thrown a lot of information at you, but, uh, you know... <laughs> Any questions on any of that? Fantastic. I have just, this is like a very small one, but you talked about the layers of love, <clears throat> and one of the layers was agape love. No, or agape. Agape? agape? What, yeah. what does that mean? Let's, let's sort of anthropomize it, okay? Agape love is like the love that a, a, a healthy grandparent has. Mm -hmm. And 15 grandchildren, right? And they love them all. Mm -hmm. It has that more of that quality, right? Whereas, obviously, romantic love is, that's her, right? Mm -hmm. Other women don't interest me, okay? Mm -hmm. But agape love, again, to sort of anthropomize it, it's like a healthy grandparent, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's, it has more of a universal uh, flavor, okay? So in dealing with the three in your family, your immediate family, right, your wife mm -hmm. and your two children, your love will be equal, and they will feel it in the same way but you will display it in a slightly different way. Obviously, it's a different relationship from a wife to a, child, to a child, right? But the sensibility is going to be the same, okay? The ideal is for your children, your sons, when they're ready to leave home, right, to say, I have no doubts that my father loved me and loves me. Okay? Uh, I don't have to have rituals or... You know, you're not going to demand that they call you on Father's Day and be upset because they didn't call you on Father's Day. You're, you're just going to know that you love them and you know they know that you love them and they love you. Mm -hmm. A lot of freedom. Okay, because now we don't need demonstrations mm -hmm. like Valentine's Day, right? Mm -hmm. It reminds me, I was working with this young man okay, and I asked him, it was going to be Valentine's, that's what it reminded me. I said, so what do you do for your wife? You know, it's going to be Valentine's. He says, oh, Nothing. I said, nothing? He said, no, she, she's not into that stuff. She's, she's not into that kind of stuff. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Does she work? Yes. Are there women, are there women in that office? Yes. <laughs> Does she have a sister? Two. A mother? Yes. I said, okay. You know what happened to St. Valentine? That's going to be nothing. That's what's going to happen to you if you forget Valentine's Day. <laughs> I said, so don't make that mistake. Obviously, he was a very young man. Okay. So, next time, I said, so how'd it go? What did you do anything? Oh, I went all out. And I'm the hero of the office. <laughs> her sisters and her mother. I said, I told you, okay? <laughs> she herself may not, okay? 
but she has friends yeah. and she has relatives, and they're going to say, "Well, what kind of husband do you have?" You know. So again, we need the rituals because we're not operating out of the fourth chakra. Mm -hmm. Because if you were, you'd know whether love was there or not. You would sense it, so you wouldn't need any other rituals. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now it allows you to be the guide, the disciplinarian to your children, but they always will know it's coming from love. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they might suspect that it's coming from your ego, or it's coming from your anger, or it's coming from something other than love. Okay? Mm -hmm. They will always then sense that whatever you told them was tailored for them. Mm -hmm. That you told them in a way that made sense to them. So they will feel very special. Mm -hmm. Okay? Well, if both of them feel that way, then that's agape love, right? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, one of them is going to say, yeah, you were always my father's favorite. Okay? Mm -hmm. but it was so obvious that, you preferred, um, that he preferred you to me. But if they can both end up saying, wow, was that amazing that he loved us the same? Mm -hmm. Then that might give them a model of what they're going to do with their life, huh? So, yeah, agape love then is that kind of a grandparent type of love. Okay? Obviously, Christ's love is universal love. See, and that's why he said, love your enemies, not just your friends. Mm -hmm. It's a universal love. Now, again, he also told us to be wise, right? So, I love my enemy, but I don't load the gun for him. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to be stupid. He's not. Re God's never requiring us to be stupid. But whatever we're doing is based on love, or say it another way, whatever they're doing does not disrupt my love. Mm -hmm. okay. Whatever action I take is not disrupting my love. But I do the wise thing. Again, dealing with a child that's three, you can't speak to them or deal with them as if you're dealing with a teenager. It's just not appropriate. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not appropriate to deal with an enemy like you would deal with a dear friend, but your sensibility is still the same for both of them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if it becomes obvious like with your children, you disarm them. Because they don't feel threatened. See, that's the thing. Right. They don't feel threatened. Okay. Now, again, you told me a little bit about your martial arts background. I, too, come from that kind of a tradition. Okay. But I was very fortunate, I don't know if you were also, but I was very fortunate to have had teachers that were actually from the Orient, mm -hmm. Korea, China, mm -hmm. okay, Japan. So they brought the old traditions with them. And unlike in the Western world, the old systems would start out by saying to you, the first principle in martial arts is don't be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't be where the turmoil is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you accomplish that? Well, you've got to be intuitive, right? The second principle of martial arts, should you find yourself there, get out as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Third principle is, if you can't get out, heal it. Mm -hmm. Now that's where the love comes in. Okay? The fourth principle is, be ready for the fight, and if you can't finish the fight in three blows, go back to... Second principle, get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very empirical. <laughs> so let's stick with the first one, right? Let's just yeah. not even be there. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. That's the best one. But again, you would have to have your intuition open, right? Mm -hmm. So again, pretty soon that faculty starts to help you in every aspect of life. Because mm -hmm. okay? otherwise... I.e., we, we look at... Now, you're not a teacher, right? You're not teaching? No. But anyway, in your business, right, you're going to get a call and you say, oh, why is this person saying that? Okay, now let, let me get in touch with my intuition, okay? Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, that, that, this is what they're saying, but this is their problem. Okay, let me address this, and this will go away. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it'll work in your business, it'll work with your family, etc., etc. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast, there are several ways you can support it. 
You can subscribe to it, leave reviews on iTunes, or wherever you downloaded it from. You can tell your friends about it or share it on social media. If you're one of George's students or friends, as I've said, my hope is that you'll take advantage of the podcast to help you remember the things he taught you, and and it'll inspire you to share what you've learned with other people through whatever medium is most comfortable. Finally, for any feedback or if you'd like more information on Wu Wu Wei or George Falcon, you can go to the soon-to-be-released website, www.wuwuwei.net. And in the meantime, feel free to email me at zeb at wuwuwei.net. Thanks as always for listening. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.